In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Around a month ago, as I was in the trenches of preparation for Holy Week and Easter, I got a note from my friend and St. John's parishioner, Mac Davis, wondering if I might consider organizing a clergy statement on the issue of the climate crisis for April 21st, the day before the 53rd Earth Day observance on April 22nd. I remember reading the note and thinking this sounds like a good idea. This sounds like a good after Easter idea. And I slid it to the side of my desk. Mac was kindly patient with me, and then a couple weeks ago, I picked the note back up, started wrapping my mind around this idea, doing some more reading and researching so I could begin to try to write this clergy statement on climate change. At this point, it's important for me to clarify a few things. I am a member of what's known as the Xennial generation, x -ennial. This is what's known as a micro-generation, bridging the gap between Generation X and the Millennials. We were born usually between 1978 and 1983. I was born in 1981, smack dab in the middle. We're also known as the Oregon Trail Generation <laughs> because every single one of us played that game on a Macintosh computer in elementary school at some point regularly dying of dysentery or losing our wagons while trying to ford a river. We're a generation characterized by the fact that we had analog childhoods with landline phones, but have had digital adulthoods. My generation grew up on a television show called Captain Planet and the Planeteers. Gaia, voiced by Whoopi Goldberg, of course, in the first few seasons, sends five magical rings to chosen young people from around the globe. These rings enable them to control elements of nature to protect the planet. But when they cannot solve the problems alone, with our powers combined, we summon Captain Planet, a male blue-skinned superhero avatar with a green mullet. <laughs> Possessing all of the Planeteer's amplified powers along with the more classical superhero powers of flight and superhuman strength. I swear to you, I am not making this up. <laughs> all that to say, my generation was raised in the era of increased attention to climate change. It is all we have ever known. Earth Day and the Environmental Protection Agency were established in the 1970s. The International Panel, Panel on Climate Change began its work in 1988 and soon released its first report about the impact of human activities on the planet. Throughout the 1990s, the consensus about the dangers of burning fossil fuels in deforestation grew. Indeed, the only Captain Planet episodes I can consistently remember were the kids stopping people from cutting down rainforests, apparently a very big problem. Same storyline over and over again, I never noticed. So as a kid, I was told all of this horrible stuff was going to happen. And then, it didn't. Or, to be more accurate, it didn't manifest in the way a kid watching cartoons about it imagined <laughs> that it would. And so I started to think, as a younger person, that perhaps this was just part of the zeitgeist of the 1980s and 90s, when so much hype, <coughs> so much was hyped and overblown about the impending end of all things. Remember Y2K? You did that to us. <laughs> and you wonder why my generation has anxiety issues. But I will say, now in my mid-40s, after having spent some of my younger years thinking that maybe all the dangers I was warned about were exaggerated, it has become clear that they were not. 
Which brings me back to the research I did to help write this clergy statement on the climate crisis. The first and most disturbing thing I read was the way that climate change, rising sea level temperatures, and shrinking glaciers will all contribute to rising sea levels. And I'm not talking about some catastrophe 100 years from now. By the year 2050, that's only a bit more than 25 years away, studies indicate that the sea level will increase an average of 4 to 8 inches along the Pacific, 10 to 14 inches along the Atlantic, and 14 to 18 inches along the Gulf. This means that significant portions of Louisiana and the coasts of Florida will be flooded. The Florida Keys? Gone. Furthermore, as is so often the case in our world, part of the reason why I have not always seen the effect of the climate crisis is because I am shielded by privilege. I live in Michigan, surrounded by one-fifth of the world's freshwater supply in the Great Lakes. I'm also able to make my life comfortable, often no matter what might happen outside. I'll just turn the AC on, or I'll fly somewhere different to go skiing when the slopes are dry in northern Michigan. But my experience, and likely some of your experiences, is not normal and is not real. It is privileged and protected from what is actually happening because the truth is that 3.6 billion people already live in areas at risk to the effects of climate change. Between the year 2030 and 2050, the World Health Organization projects that a quarter of a million people will die every single year due to undernutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress caused by the climate crisis. That's five million people over two decades dead because of the impact of climate change. And because in our country, climate change has been turned into a partisan issue instead of an existential human issue. In our clergy statement, I mentioned the fact that three years ago, the leaders of the three largest Christian communions in the world, Pope Francis of the Roman Catholic Church, Ecumenal ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew of the Orthodox Church and Justin Welby of our own communion published a joint statement on these issues. Two out of three of those are leaders of the most conservative religious bodies in the world, and they see this as a clear and existential problem. So the problem is real. The clergy statement has been published, sent to the newspapers, and here we are today with me having tasked myself in that statement to preach on this issue on April 21st, or more accurately, having been tasked by Mac to preach on this statement. And I will admit, at first I was a bit anxious. But then I turned to the lectionary readings appointed for today and read, in particular, the epistle appointed where the author of 1 John writes, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Oh yes, I think this will connect quite well. Remember, 1 John was likely written to second generation Christians from whom some members have gone out and begun to preach a gospel that is quite different than the one John had first given to them. In particular, these people who had gone out from the community have questioned whether Jesus truly did have a genuine human and fleshly existence. They don't doubt that Jesus was God, or at least somehow divine. That seems clear from what Jesus did. But they do doubt whether God would truly become a real, living, breathing human being with all of the physical realities that entails. A person who died a real and brutal death. That seemed unlikely to them. So maybe, they suppose, Jesus only seemed to be human. 
only seemed to die. But his true mission was to lead us out of this earthly life into a more spiritual existence. Christianity is about getting connected with God so you can be rescued out of this earthly life. Some heresies never go away, it seems. Because make no mistake, that's heresy and is not the teaching of Scripture or the church. This spiritualization of the gospel has had a very concrete impact on John's community. An increasing failure to love. Because if the gospel is really just leading me out of this world on a spiritual journey then why would it matter how I treat my fellow believer in Christ? As one scholar writes, in a time of schism and dissent, what is most threatening is that Christians should continue pontification about love while they hatefully turn from one another and ignore one another's needs. In our own time, when Christianity has also often become spiritual, so spiritualized that it lacks attention to the earthly and human, we see the same lack of love for others. All that matters is I'm right, and so it doesn't matter how I treat those people. Furthermore, if God is rescuing me out of this world in which I live, then why would it matter how I engage with the material world around me? Someday I'll just fly away. So when John writes, that the way God showed God's love for us was by laying down his life. He's very clear that it is a real human and earthly life. And that if we claim to be followers of Jesus, we must be willing to lay down our lives for one another. This is what love looks like. Being willing to take your real human fleshly and earthly existence and give it up for others. And true, at first we might hear laying down our lives and think of people like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. murdered in the battle for civil rights or Archbishop Oscar Romero gunned down literally at the altar while celebrating Mass because he spoke up for the poor against the violence and corruption of his own country. We might think laying down your life is the calling for those sorts of people, but... <laughs> <laughs> not for me. Which is why I think John uses that image of seeing a brother or sister, a sibling in Christ, another individual human in need, in God's love propelling you to respond. So the author of 1 John says, when you see someone in in need and hurting, and refuse to do anything to answer that need, to answer that wound, well, then the author wonders, how could you even begin to claim that God's love abides in you when you do nothing? When you see those at risk from climate change, and you are privileged and shielded by the world's goods, and so do nothing, or do only that which is comfortable and convenient, then how can you, how can we, how can I claim that God's love abides in us and do so little? Now it's true. When we look at the climate crisis that's facing us, sometimes it feels too big, too large, too much of a growing apocalyptic issue to feel like you and I might be able to do something that would make a difference. And while none of us alone can heal the planet, we can choose to see more than the looming apocalypse and instead to see the individuals who are hurting now, those who are at risk in the future. And we can ask what we can do to mitigate that hurt, to try to lower that risk. It's unlikely that Christ is bidding any one of us to die in order to protect others from the sins of the violence we've done to this planet. But we can lay down our lives by leveraging our power and our privilege, by being willing to make our lives more difficult, by making hard choices that will begin to move things one tiny small step forward. 
you're wondering what in the world that might be, good news. The clergy statement that I wrote, that many other clergy helped me with and signed on to, is in your service leaflet, including a link, sjegh.com slash 10 steps. Ten, tw it's actually 12. I, I made the link before I realized there were 12 of them. Uh, I just realized that. Um, it's actually 12 very simple steps of what you can do to make an impact on climate change. And in fact, on that bulletin insert, after the statement, I've listed all 12 of those steps and what it looks like. Because the irony here is that the climate crisis is the incremental death of our planet, which is why it's so hard to see unless you're paying attention. And the salvation of our planet will require bold action, but that's also action that may only result in incremental change. But that incremental change can multiply, particularly if we all do it together, if we all commit to ensure that our time in this planet will make it better for those who come after us and not worse. I want Lucy someday to go back to the Florida Keys and see them. Because as our author of 1 John reminds us, words and speech are not enough. They're never enough for the follower of Jesus. And words and speech are not enough for the crisis that faces humanity in this planet we call home. We must instead commit ourselves to what 1 John says, to truth and action, to pouring out our lives for the healing of this world, even to just making our lives a bit more inconvenient so that thousands of lives might be saved. Because the healing of this planet must begin with us. And it must start now.